Some African countries uh, letting their flags uh, fly at half mast as the tributes continue to pour in for the late uh, former president of Zambia, Kenneth Kawunda. Let's get more on uh, his uh, history now and the role that he's played in politics. Political and social commentator Professor Somato Tafigeni joins me now live to look at that legacy. A very good evening to you, Prof. Thank you very much indeed for your time this evening. I mean, if we look at the legacy of uh, the former Zambian president, uh, Kenneth Kawunda, Wonder, and the current leadership crop on the continent, what are your reflections? Well, I do think that the passing of uh, former President Kenneth Kaunda marks the end of an era, the founding fathers and the great visionaries of Africa who were behind the formation of a pan-African platform, which was the Organization of African Unity, now African Union. Mm. And when you compare that group of leaders, they had a long-term vision for their countries as well as the continent. And they were placing themselves in the south uh, of the globe in terms of the anti-imperial struggles. Mm. But when you compare that with the current leadership, most of them hardly articulate a grand vision beyond a four-year, five-year term. Mm. And that even is confined to their own countries. Hence, they are not featuring as major players in the continental space. Their first founding fathers, uh, you know, grand vision was, among other things, mm. making sure that they unshackled themselves from those who had controlled them under colonialism. Mm. They tried to unshackle themselves from the Cold War, which was trying to pit one against the other. But more importantly, they looked at other countries which were not yet free to make sure that they assist them to be free, even when they leave office, mm. because they were driven by a vision mm. and their power was not defined by the office they occupied. They continued with many other causes. Mm. And that's exactly what I wanted to speak to you about, Prof. I mean, uh, you talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the organization of African unity, which, is, of course, now is the African Union. Let's talk about his involvement. I mean, not just him, but the others that uh, you speak of, the, the, the Kwame Nkrumahs, the Haile Selassies and others, uh, that crop of leadership and how distinct it was from what we see at the moment. Specifically, let's talk about uh, his involvement, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, the formation of uh, the OAU? He was one of those who were involved in the formation of the OAU and in its founding stages. Mm -hmm. But more important, his contribution in that space was the issue to say right from the beginning of the formation of the OAU, no single African country will be free when others are not free. That's a foundational principle of the Organization of African Unity. Mm. And he went further. Whilst he was pressed by the national concerns of his country, which had started from a low base, yeah. to host a number of liberation organizations mm. and articulate this in every platform from the Commonwealth to, to the non-aligned movement uh, to the United Nations and all the time they were consulting using the OAU mm. as the platform. So the challenges today may be different. It might be fighting uh, COVID-19. It might be fighting poverty. It might be peace and security issues. Mm. But still, the mission is the same to say, can the continent have a continental approach when faced with these challenges, but not just on paper, but see leaders being passionate about it. And that was the group of leaders like Kwame Nkrumah, uh, like Haile Selassie, as you mentioned, like mm. Kaunda, like Julius Nyerere, and mm. so forth, mm. who drove that particular dream. And we still feel the imprint of their contribution, yeah. even though the succeeding generations of military rulers or of other rulers doesn't seem to carry the same stature, the same weight, even though in this historical moment you may have challenges equally important as was the case with the OAU. 
Uh, Prof, he lost elections uh, to the opposition. You could say it was uh, the first time democracy prevailed, paving the way for uh, opposition to take over. I mean, what lessons can other nations, I mean, even including South Africa, learn from this? He accepted the outcome. Well, I do think that the lessons are, even if you are a good dancer, you must get off the stage in good time before the song ends. And therefore, he was a public servant, not a perfect servant. The one-party rule, in many instances, was at that particular moment accepted widely. But that you had such... Over time, parties get corrupted. Over time, patronage networks do come. And the lessons we can learn here is every party that is in power must always imagine itself in opposition. And that in itself could then awaken the party into a sense of saying, what must I do to renew my legitimacy and contract with the people? But if it starts taking that for granted, and if leaders start looting and being corrupt as if there is no tomorrow, if there is a social distance between leaders and the people they govern, and if leaders or the elite, whether political or business, start being concerned about themselves, not the well-being of the society, sooner or later they will lose that legitimacy to rule and they might be ousted. And that in itself, I think, is a lesson. But most important in his case was that he accepted the outcome of his loss. Even if he was to face difficulties of detention at times, being barred by the Constitution to run again, he still believed in the Zambian dream. And he still was very loyal to the people of the country and the continent. So that in itself, I think, is a lesson. Mm -hmm. that people should take to say, when you lose, it should not lead to a Samsonian syndrome of saying, let me bring down everything yeah. with me. Yeah. Prof, just finally, I, I'm, uh, you know, some would say he wanted to make a comeback. You know, uh, at a time he was charged with allegations of an attempted coup by the opposition. He embarked on a hunger strike. And it was Tanzania's former president, Julius Nyerere, who persuaded him to end that hunger strike. Talk to us a bit about that kind of solidarity. Well, that special cohort of leadership did not only have diplomatic ties with each other. They had deep chemistry and they cared for each other. It was for that reason that he could, uh, Nyerere could provide a wise counsel to his uh, comrade and colleague to say, please do stop the hunger strike. But not only that, he persuaded him that there is life after leaving a political power uh, role. And as such, since then, Kenneth Counter went on to become one of the most successful post-president president in a sense of community outreach, in a sense of uh, fight against HIV AIDS, yeah. and also in involvement in encouraging the mm. Pan-African dream wherever he was deployed. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for your insights this evening, political analyst and social commentator, Prof. Soma Dota Figeni, we do appreciate your time.